This year, most of this year, every Sunday, I've been able to stand up here and speak to a room full of people. I've just felt incredibly blessed that we're able to come together. And my heart is with those who aren't able to be with us this morning. Uh, those of you who are joining us online and those who are in the back. And we just pray for your safety, your recovery, your wellness. And I appreciate Dwayne's prayer. We are anticipating this vaccine and we know the Lord is, is in control. And we just pray for a speedy end to this. Because like a lot of places, churches need connection. We're all about relationships and people and bringing the lost to Jesus Christ. And, and we know that when people are healthy, it's easier to do that. Yet, we've found opportunities through all of this to reach out in unique ways. And we'll continue to look. Whatever the times are, whatever the situation is, we'll look for God's will in that matter. And a lot of that has to do with, with today's subject. We're talking about love. The title of the lesson is Love's Appearance. And our text is Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Now, love is pretty easy to define. I think everyone would agree that the highest love, the Christian love we read about in the Bible, is basically an affection for another's good the desire for the very best for the other person, even before your own self. Love is not selfish at all. It thinks about the other person. And true love, committed love, is undying. I think of the Lord's words in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's what true love is. It's a commitment. It overcomes all obstacles. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses uh, 7 and following, where I think in verse 9 it says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That's what love is. And the world pays lip service to love. The world instinctively wants to be characterized by love, yet love is rare. You don't really see true love a whole lot in the world today. And why is that? If the world wants to love, why doesn't it love very often? Why is love so rare? And I think it's all about the meaning of the term good and that definition we gave just a moment ago. Love is an affection for the other's good. It's all about what good means. And from a Christian vantage point, the good there has a content. The good is God. And so from a Christian vantage point, loving another person is wanting God for that other person. Wanting that other person's life to be centered upon him. When God loves us, he wants us to have him. And so when we love others from a biblical vantage point, we should want others to have God in their lives. And so the world wants to be characterized by love. I think it does that instinctively because we've all been made in the image of God. But when it sees what love is all about, that it's about God, it backs away from it pretty quickly. And the text is all about that. In Titus chapter 3, Paul writes about the world's reluctance to love and then talks about love's appearance and finally makes an appeal to all of us to accept true love, the highest Christian love. So let's open our Bibles up to Titus chapter 3 and look first of all at love rejected. Paul begins by talking about this world's reluctance to show love. In case we're still operating under the delusion that the world is full of love, we need to look at Paul and how he begins this. He paints a portrait that is very honest and really all too familiar. You see it in verse 3. It's a list of very familiar things. It starts with foolishness. He says, we 
ourselves were once foolish. Now this gets all of us because sin is foolish. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The Lord showed the foolishness of people in the parables that he told. He told a parable of the unprepared virgins. He told a parable of the rich man who wanted to build bigger barns. He told the parable of the man who built his house on the sand. And all of these he called fools because they put their own will and selfish ambition before the Lord. So it starts with foolishness. And then we have disobedience. The next item on the list, he says, we were disobedient. This is a stubborn and rebellious reluctance to bend to the will of God. Other translations have unyielding, obstinate, rebellious. It's the same sentiment described by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23, verse 17. Everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart. That's the idea here. A rebellious spirit. Stubbornness. The next item on the list is confusion because he says they were led astray. Led astray by whom? By the one described by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this world. The God of this world who has blinded the minds of of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan has a tremendous influence in this world for some reason, which is why there's so little love. We've been led astray. Then after the confusion, you have the addiction. He says, slaves to various passions and pleasures. We're all too familiar with the tremendous destruction addiction has on our culture, in our world today. Addiction to sex, addiction to drugs, addiction to alcohol, addiction to money, addiction to power. This desire misdirected that really ought to be toward God bows down to idols in the world today, loving things other than God. And then after addiction, we read about bitterness, where he says, passing our days in malice and envy. He might as well say wasting our days in malice and envy, because what good really comes out of that kind of bitterness, out of malice and envy? As the wise man says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4, who can stand before jealousy? Have you ever thought about envy, how it's this strong desire but of all the desires, whether they're wholesome desires or, or bad desires, envy is the only one that has absolutely no reward, no pleasure whatsoever. There, a lot of sinful desires involve at least temporary pleasure, some kind of fulfillment. But what is the attraction to envy? The moment you start feeling envious, you feel miserable, and yet it's such a temptation in our lives today. This bitterness, it grows and it will eventually destroy us if it's not stopped. As the last item on the list, hatred. He says, hated by others and hating one another. Another all too familiar sign of the times. Have you ever heard the statement, I use this a lot, hurt people hurt people? You know, if people have been abused in their lives, they for some reason eventually turn and abuse others. It's the opposite of the golden rule. They treat people the way they did not want to be treated and seem to be taking their vengeance out on innocent victims. Well, the same applies to hate. Hated people hate people. When you're hated by others, you seem to have this inclination to spread the hate around. This is the picture of the world. And if we're honest about it, this is what the world looks like. It's foolish it's stubborn and disobedient, confused, addicted to passions and pleasure. It's full of bitterness and hatred. And we may deny that, but Paul says that is the truth. And this is a picture of the opposite of love. This is love rejected. He says in verse 3, 
that we ourselves were once this way. Before Jesus Christ, we ourselves were this way. Who does he mean by we? Himself and just a small group of people, maybe just the first century Christians? No. He's talking about the entire human race has this as the human default. This is where we go if Christ does not enter into our life. If we do not encounter the Son of God, this is who we are. Foolish and disobedient and hateful and all the rest. And if anything, we're not getting better. We're getting worse. It's harder and harder for us to love one another. There's a book in my library called Unselfie by Michelle Borba. And she gives some startling statistics about the loss of empathy in our world today. He says that teens are 40% lower in empathy levels than they were three decades ago. That narcissism, uh, uh, self-obsession, has increased by 58%. The, the uh, bullying has increased 52% in four years. In one of those years, uh, it increased, uh, tripled, cyberbullying tripled in 2014. And uh, evidence of bullying starts at the age of three. And so we're not getting any better when it comes to love. We're getting worse because we're getting farther and farther away from the cross. Now, we need to come to an understanding that this is where our default is. This is where we begin, not with love. We may have this, um, this inclination, this instinct to love, but we don't really know love unless we're taught to love. And we need something to bring us to our senses. I love the book Silas Marner by George Eliot. Silas Marner is about an old, bitter miser whose gold was stolen. All he ever cared about in his love was this, in his world, was this hoard of gold. And one day he was doing something around his wood pile and he came back into the house where he had a fire going. And in his poor eyesight, he thought he saw his gold returned by the hearth next to the fire. But when he reached out to grab it, he grasped golden curls of hair. It was a little girl whose mother had died and she'd crawled in from the snow to the warmth of his fire. And Eliot writes about this in this book. And she says he had a dreamy feeling that this child was somehow a message come to him from that far off life. It stirred fibers that had not been moved for many a year. Old quiverings of tenderness, old impressions of some power presiding over his life. That child woke something in him that had been dead for a long, long time. It awakened affection and love for other human beings. And we need something to bring us to our senses, just like those golden curls brought Silas Marner to his senses, to wake us up, to get us out of focusing on ourselves and, and lead us away from our false self back to our true self, to who we're really meant to be. And so that brings us to the next point in our text to Titus chapter 3. We go from love's rejects, rejection to love's appearance. Look at what he says in verse 4. He speaks of a time when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. We had a long list in verse 3, now a shorter, brighter list of just two items, the goodness and the loving kindness of God. Let's look at the goodness of God to begin with. The King James Version, by the way, has kindness. And kindness is important, but it brings up notions in our mind of something less than what God has shown us. To be kind is to, is to be gentle, to be harmless, to be nice, to have good manners at the table. But we're talking about the omniscient, all-powerful God. And so we need to understand what that kindness is. 
In the Greek, the word translated goodness or kindness here is related to the word for grace. So it has a sense of beauty to it. It's been interpreted a number of ways. It can mean God's spontaneous disposition to bless or the graciousness of the divine love for man. I like the way David sang of the goodness of God in, in uh, Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Very interesting way that he uses the poetry there, appealing to two of the five senses. Taste that the Lord is good and see that the Lord is good. And I think the reason that has such an impact on me is because it's, it's a bold thing to taste something for the first time, right? Remember when you tried a certain food, maybe an unusual food for the first time, you were probably reluctant to do so, and, and it's a risk to do it. And you do it with promises that it will benefit you greatly. Now, you don't just go pick out something you've never seen before and, and just taste it without any knowledge about it. Usually when you taste food, it's because if you're young, your parents are urging you to and telling you it's good for you and you can't have your dessert until you eat it or you're going to go to your room if you don't try it or you have to have five bites or something like that. Or maybe it smells really good or you really trust the person who prepared it or trust the person who tells you to take their word for it. It's really good. But still, it's, it's, a, it's a risk to taste food for the first time. And all of that is packed into this idea of the Lord's goodness. You won't know until you try it. But David, has said, David says, take the risk. You don't do it blindly. You know others who proclaim the goodness of the Lord. You can look around this world and see God's goodness. You know this world, this universe came from somewhere. There is a God and this God is not awful and tyrannical and vengeful. This God is love. Taste and see. If you try Him, if you worship Him, if you believe Him, if you obey Him, then you will see. But not until then, but when you do show faith, then you will see that He is good. You will see it in your life that He is good. And so Paul says the goodness of God appeared. But the second item on the list is the loving kindness of God. The goodness and the loving kindness of God appeared. Loving kindness is from the word from which we get our word philanthropy. It's a compound Greek word. Philia means love. Anthropos means human beings. And so he's talking about God's affection for humanity. Can you believe that? God has a warm, affectionate feeling for us, for all the people in all the world who've ever lived. Humanity would never invent a God like that. If you look at the invented gods, they're not really inclined towards human beings. They use them as playthings. They tempt them unnecessarily. They're mean to them. In all the stories of Greek and Roman mythology that you read, the gods are not good. They're not filled with loving kindness and affection towards humanity. They use them. They abuse them. We'd never invent a God like this, full of goodness and kindness. Now, we saw the human default before, the bitterness, the envy, the malice, the hatred. What we're looking at here in this shorter, brighter list of the goodness and loving kindness, we're looking at God's default. This is who God is. We saw who we were. Now we're looking at an accurate picture of who God is. John put it even more succinctly with a one item list. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. And this love appeared. Now the question is, when did the goodness and loving kindness of God appear? It's all wrapped up subtly in the tense of the verb here. Appeared in the Greek is in what's called an aorist tense. Now, Greek is very precise language. It can be very precise with its tenses. 
There is a past tense that is continuous in its nature. There's a, a something called the perfect tense that has to do with something that happened and is continuing to happen. But this aorist tense has to do with an event that happened at one point. So when he uses this, you may not see it in the English, but he's being very specific about some event that happened at a point in history that all history revolves around. What else could it be but the cross of Jesus Christ? That's when the goodness and the loving kindness of God appeared. So John says in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. When did it appear? When Jesus died on the cross. Maybe a more difficult question is why? Why did Jesus die for us? Why did love appear? And he answers in verse 5 with a negative and then a positive. The negative is, the negative is not because of works done by us in righteousness. Not because of that. Not because of anything that we have done, but the positive is, if you continue to read the rest of verse 5, according to his own mercy. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And if we were in God's place, we would give people what they deserve, or at least what we think that they deserve. But that is not God's nature. It's not who he is. God is love, and he wants to show mercy to his people. And that's why we have any hope at all in this world. It's because he doesn't want to give us what we deserve. And he sent Jesus to die so that he can show mercy on us. God is love. His goodness and loving kindness has appeared. A Japanese man, Toyohiko Kagawa, was an activist who endured the Second World War, and he led a movement in his country for peace and reform. Now, leading up to the Second World War, he was imprisoned in Japan by his own people three times for trying to lead peace movements. But after the world was over, the prime minister called called him for help, and he said to him, Only Jesus Christ was able to love his enemies. Help me to put the love of Jesus Christ in the hearts of our people. Kagawa was a Christian in Japan, which was very rare in those days. The emperor even gave him a half an hour to explain to him the meaning of the cross. Now you have to remember back then in Japan, the emperor was regarded as a god. But this man was so influential and he talked about the cross and the peace from the cross so much that the emperor was calling him to explain it to him. What kinds of things was he saying? Here's one of the things that he said. The cross is the crystallization of love. If you study the cross and you don't do it in light of love, you don't understand the cross because, because God's love came to a point at the cross. I think it sums up Paul's meaning in Titus 3 when he says, the goodness and loving kindness of God appeared at one point in time. The cross is the crystallization of love. Here's something else he said. As in a single word, Christ's love movement is summed up in the cross. The cross is the whole of Christ, the whole of love. When we were disobedient or rebellious and stubborn and living in malice and envy, slaves to our passions and pleasures, when we were hated by others and hating one another, the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. Love's appearance. So what's left? Let's look at the last part of this. Love accepted. Paul urges us, based on the appearance of love, to accept it. God's love does us no good if we refuse to accept it. 
And so we need to study this. How do we do that? And in verse 5, Paul names two instruments of God's salvation. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Uh, people have talked a lot about this. I want to spend a little time parsing it out. And as you look at it, it's, a, as I said, two parts. The first being the washing of regeneration and the second, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Let's start by focusing on uh, the terms that everybody thinks about the most. The first term and the last term. The washing and the Holy Spirit. Now, washing comes from a Greek term, lutron, which has to do with a bath or with washing or bathing and it obviously refers to the baptistry, to being immersed in water, to being dipped in baptism. Now, some people argue about that because they don't want to consider baptism as necessary for salvation. But here he says, how do you get to the point of regeneration? We'll talk about the meaning of that word in a moment, but it's the new birth. How do you get to that point? Through washing, through baptism. This is obvious reference to the necessity of baptism. And if you deny that, then you have to explain what the washing is. Some people want to make it the Holy Spirit, but he is talking about the Holy Spirit in the next point. So why would he do it in both points? It'd be redundant to do it. And also, if he does that, this would be the only place in early Christian literature where this word lutron, washing, is used with reference to the Spirit's work in our lives. It's beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's talking about baptism here. And if that is not enough for you, you can look at parallel passages of Scripture where Paul uses this twofold formula in other places, like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Speaking of the church and its analogy to the marriage relationship, he says that he might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by, look at the twofold formula, methodology here, the washing of water with the word. I submit to you that the washing of water is parallel to the washing of regeneration, to baptism, and the word is parallel to the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Here's another parallel passage, John 3, 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And we know the water in John 3 is the water of baptism. It's hard to deny that because there's baptisms going on all around John chapter 3. And in verse 23, it says that John was baptizing in the Jordan because there was much water there. In John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we read that Jesus' disciples were baptizing more than John's disciples were in the Jordan River. And so... Uh, John 3 very clearly uses this twofold means to refer to baptism and the Holy Spirit. And then you can also look at how Paul's own experience matches up. In Acts chapter 22, we read about his conversion. And the man who wrote about the washing of regeneration uses the term washing with reference to his baptism. It was Saul of Tarsus, later known as Paul, who heard the prophet Ananias come to his house and say, why do you wait, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So this first term, the twofold means of, of accepting love has to do with baptism. There can be no question about it. What about the second term, the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is hard to understand no matter what text you're reading about. So we're not going to work all of that out in this morning's lesson. I don't think we ever could work it all out. But it's interesting. We need to look at it in some detail. In the next verse, Paul says the Holy Spirit was, verse 6, poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And the question is, whom was he poured out upon? Now, similar language is used in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, with reference to the apostles, and that the promised Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. And that is why they were able to give the instruction of the gospel that they gave in the sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So it could be the apostles, but we also know that Peter 
brought that sermon to a climax saying, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it could be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Which one is it? Well, it's quite possible that Paul meant for both of them to be involved. Because as we'll see, we accept God's love, first of all, by following the word, the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. But also, uh, when we accept the love of God, we receive the indwelling Spirit who seals us and serves as a down payment or a guarantee of our eternal inheritance. So these terms are full of meaning, washing and Holy Spirit. We often neglect the middle terms, which also should deserve our consideration. It's not just the washing and the Holy Spirit, but it's the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And so I don't believe we're done until we understand what those RE terms mean. What does he mean by regeneration? Regeneration has to do with the new birth. And you read about it all throughout Scripture. When you become a Christian, you're a new person. Jesus talked about being born again to Nicodemus, John 3, 3 through 5. Paul says it's a newness of life, Romans 6, verse 4. He says we were uh, baptized into Christ and, and uh, we're raised up by the, as Christ was raised up from the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. He calls it a new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. All these terms mean that you're a new person when you come out of the waters of baptism because God has made you new. He's made you righteous because of His mercy and the work of Jesus on the cross. So, the washing of regeneration is the first part of that. But the second part of accepting the love of God is the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, if regeneration has to do with the day that you choose to follow Christ, the day you're baptized and become a Christian, then the regeneration, I mean, the uh, renewal has to do with the rest of your Christian life. It's every day after that. This is the often neglected Christian discipline of renewal. It's all through the New Testament. We're taught over and over again that we need to be renewed. Some people get the idea that they're baptized and then they're, they come out of the waters of baptism clean and then it's their job to stay clean for the rest of their lives. But if you think you're never going to sin again after you become a Christian, you're, you're, you're deceived in the words of John if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, John says. You're going to make mistakes. And what's important at that point when you sin is that you repent of that sin and you confess that sin. John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's renewal. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 says, Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And other passages speak of the same thing. Every morning you must rise up and be renewed. Renew your thoughts about the goodness and the loving kindness of God. Renew your thoughts about your past and how God has wiped all of that away because of the blood of Jesus, His Son. Renew your thoughts about God's power to forgive and His great, unending, undying love for you. Renew that every day and be reminded of the graciousness of God that makes, it, makes life worth living and gives you hope in eternal life after death. That's what the renewal is. And so you need both of these things to accept the love of God. You need to obey the gospel, believe in Christ, confess that He's the Son of God, repent of your sins and be baptized in the washing of regeneration. And then secondly, you need the renewal of the Holy Spirit for the rest of your life. God will give you His indwelling Spirit. 
and you need to read his word and understand the sword of the spirit every day reminding yourself of the truth as the world tries to lie to you time after time after time after time. You're no good, the world says. You're a sinful person. God doesn't love you or there is no God. The renewal of the Holy Spirit will guard you against that. Is that all there is? Just all about you? When you accept love, is, is that all there is to it? Paul continues in verse 7 saying, Being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We talk about that a lot. So is that all there is? We're baptized and then we renew ourselves daily until the Lord takes us home? There's more to it than just that. If that's all we said about it, we oversimplify it because love has a nature to be reflected. Let me put it this way. Love accepted is love reflected. We need to understand that there's more to it than just sitting around waiting on Jesus to come back. If we truly have accepted God's love, it's going to show in our lives. It's going to radiate out from us to the rest of the world. Christ's love has a way of, of becoming a controlling influence over us. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ controls us. And it's possible, or rather it's impossible, for example, to, to love God and to hate your neighbor. Because if you love God whom you have not seen, you're going to love your neighbor, your brother or sister in Christ, especially who are his children, whom you can see whose needs are apparent, the opportunities to help them are right there in front of you. Love accepted is love reflected. Great thinkers throughout history have struggled to illustrate that. For example, Thomas Aquinas talked about love as a furnace that radiates from one place and heats the whole room. If you're a lover of God and a lover of humanity, that love is going to radiate as warmth around all the people around you. More recently, Jonathan Lehman has written about God's love as a boomerang that comes down to us, and after it comes to us, it's reflected back towards him again. Because after all, love truly is an affection for another's good, and that good has to do with God. However you want to look at it, accepting love should have an effect on your life and on the lives of the people all around you. That's, that's the point that we're making. If you're washed and regenerated and renewed in the Holy Spirit, then that is going to show in your life through love. You're going to see opportunities to help people, and you're not going to have to be told by somebody else to help them. You're not going to have to have a program in church. I mean, it's great to have programs in church. It's great that the church can give you more opportunities to love. But if you see somebody in need, you're not waiting around on the elders to say, that's a situation where you need to, to buy somebody groceries. That's a situation where you need to give somebody a ride to the doctor's office. You're going to know it because that love is in your life. That love is going to spread around in your family. You're going to be the kind of father or mother or husband or wife or brother or sister that you should be. When you see somebody hurting, you're going to put yourself in their shoes and have empathy for them and do for them as you would have them do for you. You're going to get your mind off yourself. You're not just going to be focused on your own problems all the time. You're going to start thinking about other people's problems and you're going to find that it's going to bring so much more joy into your life, this love of God. And so it's not enough to just talk about how love appeared. We have to accept that love for it to do us any good. It doesn't come naturally. The world thinks this love is just what you naturally feel. It has to be taught. The gospel has to be taught. It had to be revealed. It had to appear to us. And then when we see it, it changes our lives if we accept it. Have you accepted the love of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the love of that was shown on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. Have you accepted that love in the ways that we talked about? Do you need help accepting it this morning? There's not a reason in the world that you can't accept it today 
and have your life changed in the ways that we're talking about. If you need any help, we're going to sing this invitation song. And if you're here today, you can come forward. If you're listening online, you know how to contact us. Contact us as soon as you can so that we can get with you and talk to you about how to accept this love that makes your life so much better and guarantees eternal life after this life is over. Let us help you. Come now as we stand and as we sing.